Tell me everything you want about CFD theory, it won't replace a good help file when it comes to actually using the software. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. Experience really matters when developing CFD models. And that's because in the real world, there are a lot of problems that come up and you need to know how to solve them efficiently, quickly, and effectively. So let's get into some practical solutions and tips and tricks for how you actually will do modeling in the real world. Some of the skills that I'm going to cover here are modeling approach because you need to have a basic roadmap of how a CFD project is going to go. Since when you're on step one, you actually have to be planning five steps ahead and anticipating how that will affect your project. You'll be looking at basic modeling strategy, judging convergence, turbulence, volume of fluid methods, time variation, and if you're all the way into advanced skills, mesh deformation. So there's a lot of practical skills here that we can cover. Let's get into it. The boss hands you your very first CFD project fresh out of college. And then you stare in dread realizing you don't actually know where to start. For the modeling approach, you need to have a roadmap. You need to have a basic idea of what a typical CFD project looks like so that you can understand where you're going. Because very often in step one, you need to be planning five steps ahead and understanding how that will affect your next five steps. That is very essential to CFD. So very first thing, step number one, don't jump into your software. Step number one is characterize your problem. Understand what type of a problem are you dealing with? Is it slow flow? Is it fast flow? Is it a simple problem? Is it a very complicated problem? Are there lots of interacting equations? Not many. One of the major tools that you're going to use for this are your non-dimensional coefficients. Your Reynolds number, your Froude number, your current number. These are the big things. Also, pull out a sketch pad. You know, sketch out your problem and just try to characterize what you think the flow patterns will look like. That's already going to help you get an idea of where you think you're going to get areas of complicated flow, because that's also going to tell you where you think you'll need to refine your mesh. And that's going to already start informing your meshing strategy, because step two is refine your mesh, develop your mesh. And you're going to take a first guess at it. Probably it's going to need additional refinement. That's the iterative process. That's why you want to start with the simplest initial setup possible because you are going to have problems. You're going to want to be able to easily and quickly identify those problems. So start simple. Start as simple as you can so that you can quickly identify where you've made a typo. And then once you've identified that and gotten a working solution, add in complexity, add in turbulence, add extra equations, and ensure that you have a stable simulation before you add on extra complexity. If you need to do mesh deformation, for example, don't start with that right from the beginning. Get a stable simulation first and then add it in afterwards. Always add complexity step by step after you're sure that you have a working simulation. So the basic process for any simulation project is always going to be first start with your geometry, set up your whole simulation geometry, get your domain defined. You've got your diagnostic runs where you're doing your meshing, you're doing your setup there, you're going to do your mesh independence study, then you go into your production runs where you're actually doing the run, the results that your client has asked for. That's the basic workflow. Now that includes a lot of work, and I make it sound simple, but it's actually quite a bit of effort. Now let's talk about some basic modeling strategies here. Domain size. This is one of the first questions you're going to have to ask when you're setting up your geometry. How big do I make my fluid domain? You want your boundaries to be far enough away that you can predictably dictate what the flow pattern will be at those boundaries. Little hint here, that's going to be much farther than you normally would think. Uh, that's going to be much farther than your flow patterns would show. If you think normally that, oh, the flow patterns are just about normal right here, they're just about straight in line, about oh one body length away from the body uh, uh go much farther away farther 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 and the reason for that is you're not only working about just what you see 
you're also worrying about the gradient of the flow pattern. So that's one of the things that you have to look at. And you can also plot that out you know, on your solver. Plot out the gradients of your flow patterns. That's a great thing to check. Myself, I do a lot of work in ship hydrodynamics. So here are some guidelines for a typical ship resistance free surface flow CFD problem. Uh, your upstream inlet boundary should be two to three body lengths ahead of your ship. Your downstream outlet boundary should be six to eight boundaries or six to eight body lengths behind it. Your uh, sides should be two to three body lengths to the either side of it. Uh, your top should be two to three body depths uh, above it. And then your bottom should be three to four body depths below your body. Uh, that last one there, I would also check my wave numbers to be a, as a second caveat on that one as well, because you're dealing with waves and free surfaces. But that is specific to ships in resistance. So always double check things. And if you're not sure about your domain size, one thing you can always do, do a simple test case. Pick some distances for your boundaries positions, and then try a different boundary position Make it a, a big distance, make it a big change, run the two comparisons and see if they look different. Don't look at your, don't look at your flow patterns. Look at the pressure changes on your body. See if they change much. And if you see a big change, yeah, if in doubt, push your boundaries further out. Speaking of boundaries, let's talk about the physics on them. What can you actually set for boundary conditions? Well, your software is going to have quite a few different options that you can actually set and there's going to be lots of different values you can pick there. But I would generally say that there are four major categories of physical boundary conditions that you can pick from. You've got a wall boundary condition. This is what we would apply on all of our physical solid objects, and that's a case where we have skin friction and where fluid can't actually pass through the wall typically. And if our object is actually moving relative to our flow, we might have velocity at the wall as well. That's another thing you have to consider. Then we also have velocity inlet conditions, and that's where we're specifying a vector velocity, and then the pressure is allowed to be freely calculated at that condition. We then also have pressure conditions. That can be a pressure inlet or a pressure outlet condition. Now that in those cases we're specifying the static pressure, not the stagnation pressure. So the velocity is allowed to freely vary in those cases. And then finally, we have symmetry conditions where all the gradients are set to zero. One little hint I do want to say is for pretty much every CFD simulation, you need to have at least one boundary condition for velocity and one boundary condition for pressure. These two variables, velocity and pressure, are coupled in your equations. And so if you only specify a boundary condition for one of them, the other one is unconstrained, and that's going to lead to problems for your solution. So you always need to specify boundary conditions for both velocity and pressure in your simulation. And that brings us to a wrap up for this session of practical CFD modeling. So remember, when it comes to your modeling approach, have a plan for your project. Think five steps ahead. When it comes to your boundaries, they're always going to be much further out than you really think that they should be. They need to be a far distance away from your basic body. Your boundary conditions, always remember that you need to have a condition for your pressure and your velocity. Those two always need to be there together. And really, when it comes to CFD modeling, always be skeptical. Be your own worst critic. Be always testing your conditions. Remember, a simulation is always wrong until proven correct. I hope you find this useful. Thanks very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe for more videos. And did you know that we produce more than just videos at DMS? Check out our website to find more articles, free downloads, and other help with ship design. We offer a host of engineering services for budgets large and small. So check us out to see if we can make your next project easier.